Exodus chapter number 8. Let's read verse 1, then we'll skip down and read toward the end of the chapter. Exodus chapter 8 and verse 1. The Bible said, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Now look down into verse number 25. The Bible said, And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses, uh, sacrifice, and, and, and let me just start over. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. Moses said, It is not meet so to do. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the sacrifice, the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go three days into the wilder journey into the wilderness and sacrifice the Lord to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only ye shall not go very far away entreat for me. And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people, and there remained not one. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither... Would he let the people go? You can be seated. I want you to keep your Bible open. And we're going to look into this text tonight. And you walk in the book of Exodus. It's the book of redemption. You've got uh, in Exodus, there's two great books of redemption in the Old Testament. There's the book of Exodus, redemption by power. And then the book of Ruth, it's redemption by purchase. And there's one thing about it. If you're going to get saved, it's going to be by the power of God and by the purchase of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But God showed himself mighty uh, as he brought the nation of Israel out of the Egyptian bondage and he worked many miracles to get them out but you begin to read about all that God did to bring the nation of Israel out of Egypt there's a lot of folks that look at some of the things that go on in the in the book of Exodus and they scratch their head and they wonder did it really happen I remember a little boy came home from Sunday school uh, one morning his mother said honey what'd you learn today at Sunday school and he said well mama he said uh, we learned about the, the people of e the people of Israel coming out of Egypt and uh, she said you did he said well tell me about it that little boy said mama he, she said you know what happened he said what happened son he said the night before the Israelites left Egypt he said is the Israeli army dynamited uh, all the houses of Egypt and said when they got ready to leave said they had uh, all the tanks leading them out and they had airplanes over the top of them uh, protecting the tanks and said they marched out of Egypt and they came to the Red Sea so Moses has got all the engineers together and they designed some floating pontoon bridges uh, and they went across the Red Sea on those floating pontoon bridges and said mama when they got all to the other side uh, he said the Israeli army blew up all the pontoon bridges uh, and drowned Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea and the mama stepped back looked at her son said baby uh, do you, is that really what happened he said no mama he said but if I told you how it really happened there's no way in the world You'd believe uh, uh, what happened when they came out of the, the out of Israel. Man, I tell you, people say, "Well, I just don't believe that they crossed the Red Sea." I, they, they, some of them think the Red Sea was just a little creek uh, that they passed over. I said, "Well, believe it any way you want to." I said, "Because those one of the two things happened: either they walked through the Red Sea and God parted the Red Sea, and uh, then they drowned the, the entire Egyptian army in the Red Sea, or the miracle was when they crossed the Red." creek. Uh, uh, then God drowned the whole Egyptian army in a creek. Amen. Uh, either way, there
there's a miracle, but I just believe it uh, the way the Word of God said it, that it was a Red Sea. I want you to notice, flip back with me just a couple of pages. I want you to notice the revelation that God had given Moses about what he wanted him and the nation of Israel to do. Look at Ephesians 3, or excuse me, Exodus 3.18. The Bible said, and they shall hearken unto thy voice, and thou shalt come, and the elders of Israel unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, he said, this is what I want you to tell them. He said, you tell them, the Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, now let us go, we beseech thee, three days journey into the wilderness, uh, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. What a testimony uh, of the Lord of the Hebrews hath met with us. Uh, uh, can I tell you, that's what I want the testimony to be. Uh, every time we come together as a body of Christ uh, and we meet together, I want to be able to go out of here uh, and say, brother, the Lord met with us. Notice what he said in Exodus 4 verse 23. And he said, I say unto thee, let my son go uh, uh, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, uh, even uh, thy firstborn. Uh, and then drop down to Ephesians, or excuse me, Exodus 5, 1. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Uh, may I say to you, listen, as God began to reveal to Moses uh, uh, what the commandments of God was, step by step, uh, and may I say to you, there is something, there's truth uh, uh, that is uh, that we can find in the order uh, uh, that God gave the nation of Israel. He first of all, he said, I want you to go out three days journey into the wilderness, uh, and I want you to sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, and then he said, I want them to go out there and serve me. Uh, and then he said, I want them to go out there and worship me. Uh, and may I say, listen, that was the, uh, the clear, concise instruction uh, of the word of God. Uh, but I think you think about those instructions that he gave. Uh, he said, first of all, I want you to go out there and sacrifice uh, uh, to the Lord your God. Uh, uh, may I say to us, that's where it all starts, friend. Uh, uh, that's where it all starts. There was only one sacrifice uh, uh, that took place in the land of Egypt, uh, and that was that slaying of the lamb, uh, uh, that they could be brought out under the shed blood uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and may I say to you, there's only one way uh, uh, that a, a sinner can stand in peace uh, and quietness of soul uh, in the presence of a holy God. Uh, and it's when they put simple faith uh, in the finished atonement uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, Paul got it right when he said, there stood by me this night uh, and angels whom I, whom I, whose I am and who I serve. Uh, uh, may I say to you, it, it brings much more. Uh, it's more important whose you are uh, than who you are. Amen. Uh, uh, what's important is who do you belong to tonight? Uh, uh, that is the question. Uh, I think about that same order. It's the order that it was in the tabernacle. Uh, the first thing you came to in the tabernacle uh, was the brazen altar. That's where the sacrifice was made. Uh, that's where blood was shed. Uh, and then you left that uh, uh, you left that brazen altar and then you went in there to the table of showbread and you went in there to the laver uh, where the laver where the priest would serve and then you go in there to where the table of the showbread was and that's where they would fellowship together. Uh, God was laying out that pattern friend. Uh, can I tell you it was a happy day uh, when I got under the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, there's only one cure for sin. Uh, it's not uh, It's not rehabilitation uh, but it's regeneration. Uh, the Bible still says without the shedding of blood uh, there is uh, no remission of sin. Uh, you can clean it up all you want to. Uh, uh, you can lengthen it up all you want to. Uh, you can shorten it up all you want to. Uh, and you can clean your mouth up all you want to. Uh, uh, but the problem's not your mouth. Uh, and the problem's not your hair. Uh, and the problem's not your mind. Uh, the problem is your heart. Uh, uh, it's deceitfully wicked. And who can know it? And the Lord said, if you're going to start somewhere, you're going to have to start with a sacrifice. And then you can go to service. And then you can sit down and sup with me. He gave them explicit instructions about what he wants us to do. But then Pharaoh begins to talk to these men 
And that's what I want to deal with, what Pharaoh has to say to Moses. This is what I want to preach on tonight. Perk your ears up, young people. I want to preach on the danger of making a deal with the devil. The danger of making a deal with the devil. Look at verse 25. Look at what your Bible said. And Pharaoh called up for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. Now, if you were just to browse across that verse 25 and you were just sort of to look at it in just a moment, you would think that Pharaoh had got to a place that he was going to be agreeable uh, uh, and to the point that he was going to uh, recognize the futility of his efforts uh, uh, to stand against the almighty uh, uh, God of heaven. Uh, but when you take a little closer look and a closer uh, consideration of verse number 25, uh, I want you to find that he was far from being ready to comply uh, with God's request for the nation of Israel uh, to go into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, I mean, listen, God's commands. Uh, a lot of times people want to act like God's got a lot of gray area, friend. Uh, uh, there's not near as gray, but as much gray hair as people want to make it out to be. Amen? Uh, uh, they just don't want to do what's black. They don't want to do what's black, uh, and they don't want to do what's right. Amen? Uh, so they they try, to, they try to make it a lot more difficult uh, uh, than it needs to be. But God's commands, uh, uh, they were not shrouded in secrecy. Uh, they were not confused. And he told them, uh, I mean, he said, you go tell him the God of the Hebrews uh, hath met with us uh, and I want you to go three days journey in the wilderness. Uh, uh, from this point forward, at three days always speaks of resurrection. And God wanted to bring them completely out uh, of the land of Egypt, put a separate between them and bring them out in victory. I'm telling you, he said, go three days a journey into the wilderness. And man, he said, nope, he said, I tell you what I want you to do. I want you just to sacrifice in the land. Just sacrifice in the land. Can I tell you, Egypt, what would problem with that is this. Egypt represents the world. Egypt's a type of the world. But can I tell you, the Bible said to us that we've been delivered from this present evil world. The Lord said of his apostles, you are not of this world, but I've chosen you out of the world. And again, he said, they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. And James said, the friendship of the world is enmity with God. But the first compromise that Pharaoh offered them was to worship in the land. You say, what's the problem with that? Well, if you're going to worship in the land, you're going to have to surrender your soul. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Egypt, again, is a type of that world. And Satan's desire for us today, Satan's desire is for the church today not to leave the world not to leave the world's lifestyle not to leave the world's priority he wants you to stay exactly where you are can I say this to you it's very obvious serving the Lord is not a priority of this world I mean man this lost world they don't even realize they're lost without God they're blind to their condition and they're not looking for a change uh, can I say this to you tonight Satan uh, desires that believers uh, he, he desires that saved people People uh, uh, live like unsaved people. Amen. Uh, and brother, in our day, uh, I mean, I believe he's getting his wish in a lot of places. Amen. Uh, I mean, friend, listen to me. Uh, it's okay. I, the, the devil says like this. It's okay uh, uh, to talk about God. It's all right to name him. It's all right to uh, claim him. He said, but listen. Uh, he said, what I want you to do, uh, even though you name his name and you talk religious talk, he said, what I want you to do, uh, I want you to stay in Egypt. I want you to live like the Egyptians. Don't separate yourself from Egypt. And don't separate yourself from the carnality of the world. He said, man, don't trust Christ as your Savior. But if you do, for heaven's sakes, don't live like him. Mercy. Are you listening to me? Compromise with carnality is has been an effective tool of the devil to weaken the Christian for all these years. You better believe this like a porcupine in a balloon factory. 
Carnality and holy worship do not mix. You put them together, you put carnality and you put and, and you put holy worship together. What you have done is you have confused the message. You have a conflict in the message. Satan is he is consistently and he is persistently trying to get the church in the day in which we live and the way he's done it all the way through time to compromise, to mix, to adopt of the mindsets and the philosophies of the wicked world when it comes to music. Uh, when it comes to alcohol, when it comes to music, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to divorce, uh, when it comes to gambling, when it comes to homosexuality, uh, whether it comes to anything, uh, the devil wants to us to mix our mentality with the world and be just like them. Right. Right. Preacher and I were talking at lunch today just how some of the the marriages of theology and contemporary worship have come together. Absolutely, but if, if what I see on online, what I see on social media, if that's church, I shouldn't have got saved. Because I didn't listen to that. I didn't listen to that music before I got saved. I mean, if I, if I went and started listening to some of that, I, I didn't even listen to that when I was lost. Y'all all right? I mean, hello? Amen, friend. And there's some of you sitting here today, you may be lost. And man, you've heard him thunder. You've got to come out of Egypt under the, uh, under the blood-stained banner. You've got to make a break with the world. And you've got to turn your back on your sin. And you've heard him thunder it. And you've heard him thunder it. And you've heard him thunder it. Yet the devil slips up in your pew and whispers in your ear. Uh, he's just an old-fashioned preacher. Uh, uh, you don't have to make a break with Egypt. You don't have to make a break with the world. Uh, I mean, he said, buddy, you can be religious. Here it is. Just don't don't be a fanatic about it. And he comes and preaches the next week and the next week and he has men come in and they preach what he preaches. And you're still sitting there thinking, I don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. If you try to worship God in Egypt, you'll lose your soul. You'll lose your soul. You'd be amazed at how many people are trying to worship God and they've never come out of Egypt. That's why, that's why this new flesh of worship is so popular. They ain't got to quit anything. They, they've not got to change anything. They come in and they're listening to the same thing they're listening to uh, after they got saved as they were before they got saved. Nothing changes about their life. There's no responsibility. There's no edification toward holiness. There's no edification trying to reach people up for Christ. Uh, and man, they're in the same place they've always been. But the problem is they think they're okay. They think they're okay. The devil has convinced us in this modern day they have convinced us in this modern day that we don't really need to come out of Egypt. See, we just need to change our terminology a little bit. And instead of talking about wickedness, we talk about weakness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Amen. It's just weakness. It's, you know, you remember, you remember when we were, when I was a young boy, they called people drunks. Yeah. Now it's a sickness. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, most of them folk don't get sick anymore. No. <laughs> they done drank so much they don't get sick. It ain't a sickness. It's a choice. Right, right. Amen. And what happened is that choice that they started as a fun thing now has become something. Hey, Brother Willard said it years ago, our flesh is a wonderful servant, but it's a terrible master. Right. And man, when they started, it was just a fun. It was just, it was for fun. A few moments, but now they got to have it to get up. They got to have it to get through. They got to have it to lay down. Why? Uh, because they never made a break. Instead of wickedness, we talk about weakness. And instead of regeneration, we talk about education. Well, you stay out here in Egypt and get educated. You don't need to be educated. I'm for education. I mean, get every bit you can, but don't ever let your education thwart your schooling. Right, right. Well, Amen. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, man, I'm, are you listening to me? Everybody wants to, we get all the degree. You listen, you can have, uh, I, I mean, man, I've got a, I've got a, College, I got a high school degree. I graduated honors. I graduated from honors from college. I got my master's degree and my doctorate degree. And if I hadn't been saved, I'd go to hell just like the most ignorant person that couldn't read his name in boxcar letters. Right. Right. It's not about education. It's about regeneration. Right. You say, well, I, 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 and this idea, we're, we're preaching such a cheap Christianity today. We'll tell people they can get saved and it's okay if their life never changes. You ain't found that kind of salvation in your Bible. Right. Right. Hey. Amen. Yeah. I mean, they got to have a t-shirt, got to have a bracelet and feel convicted. Man, if the Holy Ghost that's supposed to be living inside of you yeah. can't check you when your mind's not right yeah. and when your heart's not right and when your mouth's not right, friend, uh, uh, man, you're missing something. Yeah. Are you listening to me? Are you listening? Hey, he says, hey, you ain't got to come out. Just, you realize if they would have worshiped God in the land and sacrificed those bullocks, the Egyptians would have killed them in the streets. Because those Egyptians believed that those animals were gods. They'd have killed them in the streets. He said, man, I can't, Moses said, I can't sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians in front of them. You can't do it. Are you listening to me? Satan will listen, young as listen to me. Satan will lie to you and tell you that you can have the world and have Jesus too. I'll just be honest with you, not just Satan, we got preachers that'll lie to you. They'll tell you you can have the world and have Jesus too. Only problem is that's not what the Bible said. It said a man, no man can serve two masters. He'll love the one and hate the other. And hate the other. And we have done a disservice preaching to people and tell them, hey, come trust Christ as your Savior and tell them that, listen, that their life will never change and they can go on living. And what did Paul say? Shall we continue in sin? God forbid. I mean, man, it ought to change us. And here's the thing. You're not going to get saved until you get ready to come out of Egypt. Because until you get tired of your sin, you ain't never coming out. Listen to me. If you're really living for Jesus, your commitment to Jesus will be offensive to the world. And if you're living for the world, your commitment to the world will be offensive to Christ. You can't have them both. You can't have them both. He said, stay in the land. Sacrifice in the land. He said, hey, you're going to have to surrender your soul. Number two, look at the second. Look at the second. Look at verse 28. Look at our second compromise he wants to make with them. Pharaoh said, I'll let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only ye shall not go very far away entreat for me and honestly he didn't want to let them go that far but he is tired of the flies in his house yeah. yes, he is tired of the flies in his plate He's tired of the flies in his bed. And he really just wanted them, he wanted Moses to pray that God would take that a plague off of him. He says, I tell you what you can do. You can go, just don't go very far. Amen. Listen to me, youngins. The Satan will give you as much rope as you want as long as you're still on it. He'll give you as much rope as you want as long as you're on it. Can I say this to you? The world doesn't care if you claim to be saved. The devil doesn't care if you claim to be saved. What they want you to do, they don't want you to live like you're saved. They don't want your child, they don't want your a life to change. A sold out Christian is an abomination to the world, but a sold out Christian is a threat to the devil. Amen. When people see your life change, what a testimony that can be. Uh, that God could use you to bring your friends, uh, uh, your neighbors and your family to the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, Pharaoh was ready to lift them the chain, but here's the fact, it was still a chain. It was still a chain. 
He wasn't ready to complete, to give the Israelites complete liberty. He wanted them. I remember my daddy used to train bird dogs when I was a boy. When he was a boy, when I was a little fella, we always had bird dogs. And daddy would always, during quail season, he would always hunt. And I couldn't wait till I grew up and got big enough. I wasn't big enough to walk through the thickets. And I know it's hard for y'all to believe I wasn't big enough. There was a day when I was skinny. It was a long time ago. Somebody seen precious memories, amen. But I would watch him. It was my job to feed those dogs. And I would watch him as he got ready to, as he got ready to train those, those young pups to teach them how to point and teach them how to back. And uh, he, he, he would have a set of quail wings on a, on a, fishing, on a fishing pole and a, and a reel. He'd throw it out there in the yard and he'd put a, he'd put a long, when those young pups were little, when they were young, he would put a very short leash on them. Long enough to where he could put it out there and he could still jerk them pretty tight, teaching them how to point and back. But even as they got older and got more, got more proficient in what he had trained them to do, they might have had a long lead. I mean, there was times they would have a lead about as long as the entirety of our backyard because he wanted to give them enough room when they, they were away from him that they wouldn't run out of the yard. But he wanted to steal the safety. If they got too far, he could bring them back. And some of you have got out of Egypt, but when you really try to get sold out in a meeting, mm, you really go, well, you really want to get out there and get serious about serving God, being a witness and being a testimony and, and getting your Bible and have a prayer life. And man, you'll get to start to get close and all of a sudden you feel a tug. Yeah. He, he's checking you. He, 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 he's just lost your soul. He knows you can't go to hell, but he don't want you to change anybody else's life. So he's pulling the rope, friend. Are you listening to me? I mean, he'll say this, hey, if you're going to get saved, all right, but just don't go too far. Hey, if you're going to go to church, let me, let me suggest a few. Let me, let me suggest some churches that don't say anything about, you know, don't say anything about gambling and fornication and rock music and immodest. Don't, 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 just go to them. I got some that I reckon. What I want you to do is, it, I can't do anything about the fact you got saved, but what I want to do is keep you from going too far. Some people get saved and they spend the rest of their life being torn in two because they want to serve God, but they've never come all the way out of Egypt. He said, so if I can't get you to surrender your soul, I'll get you to surrender your separation. He said, what I want you to do, you can go out of Egypt, just don't go real far out of Egypt. Don't go too far out of Egypt. Every one of us are tempted to be borderline Christians. Every one of us in here are tempted to be a lukewarm Christian. Every one of us, man, you get saved and, and, and man, you get born again. You know your name's written in heaven, but that's as far as you've ever gone. Mercy. Mercy. You know that the, if the trumpet sounded tonight and the Lord raptured the church, you know you're going. But that's all you know. You ever... I, See, do you remember the song that you sing, the girls' home you sing? You've been young, but you might have heard it since then. The girls' homes you sing that Mephibosheth. My favorite line of that song is in the bridge. He said, I rejoiced to see the bridges burn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Our problem is some of us ain't never burned the bridge back to Egypt. Oh. You trying to fill this thing to call the Christian life out? While still looking back there, you, 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 want, you want peace in your life that you know you're not going to hell. You want peace in your life. You want your parents off your back, but you don't want to be so far for God that you can't run back over there, have a good time with your friends, be accepted in your friends, not have to bear the reproach of being a child of God. I mean, you're trying to serve him. And all the while, you can hear the sounds of Egypt in your past. You can hear the sounds of Egypt in your ear and the faintness of that sound. And every time you hear it, you're tempted to run back. Mercy. It'd almost be a blessing to see some folks in this meeting just burn the bridges. 
and say, I'm not going back. I'm not going back. Amen. I remember the day I walked out of the, I, I mean, I was a, a banker before I went full time in the ministry. God called me to preach my freshman year of college. And, uh, and I, I finished school and, and I was working at the bank and refereeing, the high, uh, refereeing and umpire and going to Bible college all at the same time. And, and I remember, I remember in the summer of 2002 where I took, my, I took my name tag off my desk. I put it in my briefcase. I put my business cards in my briefcase and I locked it down. And I, I lit the bridge. And I said, I'm not going back. Hallelujah. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Hey, I may have to one day if, if they ever get tired of me being the pastor. And I've worked before and I'll work again before I compromise the Bible. Can I say hey, hey. word right there? Amen. Right. But it was a glad day of my life when I just threw in. I just threw in. Are you listening to me? Notice the next one. Look at verse, turn over to Exodus 10. Verse 8 through 11. The first thing he said, hey, just surrender you stole. Don't come out of Egypt. You know why most folks don't get saved? Because they enjoy their sin. I, I preach to young people all the time. I believe, I, I believe they've got a, they have got a, they have got a real desire to trust Christ. They really make play in their mind. They have plans when they get out of their teen years. Maybe they get out of their uh, maybe they get out of their college years and they're gonna settle down, get saved, and live right. But sometimes those days never come. Man told Paul, he said, "I'll call for you in a convenient season." Season never came. If you're not careful, you'll surrender your soul. Some of them have been saved, but we've surrendered our separation. He's still got us on a chain. Number three, Exodus 10. Look at verse number eight through 11. Moses and Aaron were brought again. Pharaoh, and he said to them, go serve the Lord your God. But who are they that shall go? Moses said, we will go with our young and our old and with our sons and our daughters and our flocks and our herds will we go. For we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be so with you, as I will let you go, and your little ones look to it, for evil is before you. Not so. Go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord that ye did desire. And they are driven, and they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. The first thing he said was you're gonna have to stay in the land. The second thing he said was you can go, but you can't go far. Third thing he said was, you can go, but you can't take your children. See the danger of making a deal with the devil, if you don't surrender your soul, you may surrender your separation. Well, if you don't surrender your separation, the next thing he wants you to do, he wants you to surrender your seed. He said, you can go worship. See what he's telling, what he's telling y'all and what he's telling y'all, and what he's telling y'all, and what he's telling y'all, y'all go on and serve God. Just give me your kids. Yeah. That's what he's telling. That's what he's telling. Pre hey, y'all, you old folks, you middle-aged people, you young parents, y'all sell out to God. Do what you want to do. I can't do anything about it. Just leave your children with me. You, you let enough places do that. Enough, enough moms and dads that name the name of Christ do that. And, and our churches are a generation away from locking the door. You're right. God help. He said, go. He said, go, fellas. Go on out there and worship God. Just leave me, your children. You know why the liberals are after our children so much? Because they know that's the future of what we're trying to do. He said, look here. John R. Rice said the best way to get rid of criminals is quit raising them. Yeah. Good. Good. I hear parents say, preacher, now, you know, I'm just not going to force religion on my children. Mm. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about forcing your kids to make a prof you, you, I'm Look, I had my little one come to me in a Longhorns one night. 
Riley, my oldest, he got saved, and y'all met Riley, and, and Carter's the younger one, and he's in, he's in nursing school. He, if he can get through this OB class, God help, Lord Jesus. <laughs> he told that OB professor, he said, ma'am, if I ever get out of this class, I'll never do this again. <laughs> he's got like two weeks left in that class. Carter came to me, Riley was telling Dr. Wendell Runyon, preacher, we were sitting at the Longhorns in Gainesville, and Riley told Brother Runyon about him getting saved. And Carter was sitting at the end of the end of the end of the table, and he's he got up and walked over to me, just squalling. He's about six. He came over to me and said, "But what's wrong?" He said, "Daddy." He said, "I'm the only one in our family that's not saved." Mm. He said, "Daddy, I don't want to go to hell." Mm. And I said, "But," I said, "Who told you you were going to hell?" He said, "Daddy, you did." while you was preaching. And I said, Bubba, I, I said, then you got to get saved. I said, but son, it's not enough that I told you. Yeah. I could have, I could have led him to the Lord and let him make a profession right there. But me telling him wasn't enough. It was going to have to be the Holy Ghost telling him. So I'm not talking about forcing your children, but I am talking about raising them in the shadow of the steeple and uh, teaching them the word of God and standing between them and the world. I told some teachers at school, man, they, they want to pump that, that sodomite agenda in our children and, and, and our, our kids went to public school. I just told them, I said, look at here, I'm not here to be your friend, I'm here to be their daddy. Right. And I said, if you're going to put that in your class, send them to the library, give them a book. They're not doing that. We don't do that in our home. I wouldn't be a smart ass. I said, but ma'am, you got to understand something. Those are the two greatest treasures I have. And God didn't give them to you. He gave them to me. Right, right. Amen. Yeah. And I would listen. I told, I told our boys in high school, I said, you tell your friends anytime you want to, I'll be your scapegoat. I don't care what they think. You tell them daddy won't let you do it or daddy will half kill me if he can't. Catches me do it. I said, I'll be your scapegoat anytime. Mm -hmm. But I listen, I didn't force them to get saved, but you better believe I was going to put as much of the knowledge of God in their life. I was going to teach them right and try to build them into the men oh, that God would have them to be. I'm telling you, the world wants us to surrender our children. That's why they pump most of this stuff through those cartoons. Are you listening to me? Surrender your seed. You ought to thank God if you've got a parent that know how to say no. Yeah. And say, we're not doing that. We're not going there. Because I know, I, I know in a few places in my life kept me from ruining my life. I'll never forget, I graduated from high school. Captain of the football team. I know it don't look like I'm very athletic, but there was a day when I could play. Amen. That's why I like playing basketball with Sid at camp, because it makes me feel like I can play again. And I can't shoot anymore, so I just throw it to her and let her shoot, because she could still shoot. Amen. And I still set a pretty mean pick, don't I? Amen. Them little skinny teenage boys come running like hitting the wall, praise God. I'll help them up now and give them some Tylenol when I'm done. It's pretty enjoyable. <laughs> They all come in there with that swagger. You let them, see them boys, all that swagger, they like to play out there in the three point line. Yeah. But when they get in there and play where the men play in there in that dark part, the paint, yeah. they decide they want to go back out there and play where the boys do. Yeah. Are y'all listening? Yeah. I'll never forget captain of the football team, co captain of the basketball team, one co captain of the baseball team. And I'll never forget, I graduated on a Friday night. And they were having a big ordeal at a farm up in the northern part of our county, only about five miles from where I pastor now. And this family was going to let all the seniors come over and just sort of hang out. And I, I knew better than they were just going to hang out. Y'all understand that? Nobody really said all that, but there was an understanding probably what was going to happen. And I'll never forget, we had a little stoop up in our, from our den into our living room or into our dining room. And I sat there and I begged my daddy that night. I said, Dad, just let me go. I'm not going to do that. And I really had no intention of doing that in that, into that, into that mess. He said, no. And you know, I sulked and pouted, tried to get my way. <laughs> and my ex-MP daddy looked at me and said, hey. I mean, he said, you can sulk and pout all you want to. He said, but you're not going. 
He said, I don't care if you lay down there and cry like a baby. He said, I'll whip you, and then you're going to go to your bedroom. And you're still not going to go. And I believed he could still do it. You said, you're 18 years old. I came in one time. I just got my T-shirt. I just got my T-shirt from my football. It said the 300-pound club. And that was not my weight. That's what I could bench. <laughs> and I come in one day, and I thought, Daddy. I said, I think I can take you. I have my 300-pound benching shirt on. He said, really? I said, yes, sir. He got up, walked over to me, put his arm up like this. He said, you really think you can take me? I said, yes, sir, I probably can. You got a little older now. You know, my dad was 39 when I was born. So he's 57. He took his arm, he put it up like that right there. He said, you really ready? I said, yes, sir. Put it, I put, he said, put your hand right there. So I put my hand right there. He said, you ready? I said, yes, sir. He said, you probably ought to put both hands on there. So I'm standing there. My dad was 6'2". He's a little shorter than I am. Had his arm up like this. I had both my hands. And he said, are you ready? And when I got the yeah, when I just got that yeah syllable out to yes, he said, bam! <laughs> Me holding his arm with my 300-pound shirt on. He said, you ready? I, and I said, hey, man, like, it was like that Tom and Jerry commercial. Them yellow birds was going around my head. He patted me on the backside and said, let me know when you get ready again. <laughs> so yes, I believed him when he said he with me. <laughs> but you know what? That next week I found out what went on there. And you know what my daddy did by telling me no? He probably saved my future. Because what he said was, you can't have my seed. You can't have my seed. Number four, and I'm done. One more place. He said, surrender your soul. If you make a deal with the devil, you may have to surrender your separation. If you make a deal with the devil, you may have to, you have to surrender your seed. Look at Exodus 10 and verse 24. And Pharaoh called unto Moses. Come on back to the piano, buddy. Roll. Come on back. Boy, you're doing a good job on that piano. Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, go, you serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. All right, now we're to the fourth compromise. He says, take everybody, but leave your gods behind. Think about it. This is what he said. If you go, if you go all the way, and if everybody goes, what I want you to do is leave your stuff here leave your stuff here but see the only problem with that is for the child of God everything we have belongs to him somebody's sitting there thinking preacher I thought 10% of what I had was his no 100% of what you have is his you just got to give 10 back to him and he can ask for you the rest of it he said if you go and if I can't keep you from going all the way and I can't keep you from taking everybody with you, just leave your stuff here. Well, here's the only problem with that. What did he first tell them to go out there and do? He said, go out there and sacrifice. Now, let me ask you something. If they left all their herds, their flocks and herds, and they went out there, that's exactly right. They'd have nothing to worship him with. Some of us have got out of Egypt. Some of us have got way out of Egypt. Some of us are even trying to bring our youngins out of Egypt. But our stuff's back there. We ain't got nothing to worship him with. He says, hey, I couldn't get you to surrender your soul. I couldn't get you to surrender your separation. I couldn't get you to surrender your seed. So just surrender your substance. Just surrender your substance. First thing the devil tried to do was to keep them in the land. And then he tried to keep them near the land. And then he tried to keep part of them in the land. But then he just decided if he could keep their stuff, he could keep them from worshiping. Here's my question to you. Have you made a deal with the devil? Mm. 
some of you think when Brother Doug gets up here and thunders to come out, come out, get saved, come out of the world, you're thinking, I ain't got to do that. Everybody I see on TV, they act in the same way they've always acted and they say they're fine. Yeah, but the problem is the judgment's not here yet. The rapture's not here yet. There's going to be a whole lot of folks that ain't going to figure out that they ain't got the goods until it's too late to get them. And if you could stay in Egypt and live after your sin, live any way you wanted to, then his, his death at Calvary was for naught. It was for naught. If he didn't come to change your life, then he didn't need to die. And his sacrifice would be a waste. Some of you, if you died tonight, you know you're going to heaven. You know you're a child of God. But every time, every time in a, when you really get ready to serve God and get serious about it, you feel this little tug. You feel this little tug. Oh, you've got a lot of leeway, but the problem is you're still on his leash. Right. You never can get over the hump. You never can get over the hump of your assurance. You never can get over the hump of trying to serve God. Never can get of the hump of just putting the world behind you, going for Christ with everything you got. Mom, dad, if you're not careful, the devil will tell you, well, boy, you just can't be real fanatic. You've got to let them make up their own mind. I mean, they can make up their own mind when they start paying the bills. As long as they live with me, they won't be making up their mind whether they go to church or not. I don't care if they're adults. I don't care if they got a full-time job and making more money than me. I mean, my, my oldest just graduated from engineering school. He told me what he was going to be making. I, I was like, can I move in your basement? I mean, hey, man. You said you're just trying to control them. No, I'm not. But I am trying to lead them. If they won't start making adult decisions and living like adults, they can make their own decisions. They can pay their own bills. They can live in their own home. You say, I just can't force them, preacher. Well, I promise you this, the world will do everything it can to take them to hell, and you better do everything you can to get them to heaven. An old preacher told me years ago, an old mountain preacher, talked about preaching the power of God. He told me, and y'all are learning this with him getting married. He said, the greatest days of my life. He said, the greatest days of my ministry was when I used to load the family up in the car and we went to church as a family. It don't seem that long ago, does it? But then at times it seems way long ago. When you and Miss Nick get in the car and the kids, you can look in the rear view mirror and they're back there. They might have been fighting like cats and dogs, but they were with us. Those were good days. Those were good days. I never forget the, my mom was sick. My mom and my dad died 13 days apart in December of 20. My mom had Alzheimer's for about a decade. And I'll never forget Brother Earl, the, the man I'll be going home to bury after tomorrow night. Him and Brother Mark and the boys were singing, I firmly promise you. You remember that old good song? I firmly promise you that I'll meet you by the river. And in that service that night, the Lord told me, he said, go back there and pray. Will you, you better be mindful of the Spirit of God when he leads you to do things. Most, you realize this, the most easily offended person in the building when you come to church is the Spirit of God. That's why Paul said, quench not the spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. The Lord told me that night, he said, go back there and pray with your parents. I walked back there to them and, and mom, her mind was gone. Starting, she occasionally could still remember me. But they were sitting about here and dad was sitting out here. Mom was spread out just a little bit. And I got in between them and got on my knees between them. And I said, mom, dad, I said, one more time, I want you to put your hands on me and pray for me. And my mom put her little feeble hand on my cheek. 
my dad, he had a wide, he had the wide back of his hand. And I, he put his hand on the back of my head and almost gripped it like he did when I was a little boy. And we prayed together. What I didn't know is that would be the last time that my mom would ever come to church. She was never well enough to come. The next time she came to church, I let her casket in and I preached her funeral some years later. Do you think I've got the least bit of regret to my mom and dad taking me to the house of God, raising me right, putting character and integrity in me? Oh, no. I never, mama could call me whatever she wanted to and I'd have answered. But I remember the, sometime just not too far before that, she came down and for 40, 40 some years, she had been the one praying for me. On a Sunday night, they were singing and people were coming to the altar and she came up and she stood, I was on the platform and she stood up and looked at me. It was the first time she ever said it like this. She said, preacher, will you pray for me? So for the first time in over 40 years, the role was reversed and she wasn't praying for me, but I was praying for her. And I don't think she regretted right. raising me to serve God. Right. You moms and dads that have got these little ones, do everything you can to get her to Jesus. Because one day, she won't be in your home and it'll happen quicker than you realize. Quicker than you realize. The first time I held my 24 year old, he, he was a preemie. I held him in the palm of my hand, literally. The he weighed three pounds and 11 ounces. I held him in the palm of my hand. And now he's 24 and gray-headed. And it seems like it happened in about three weeks. Yeah. Mom and dad, I'd surrender my friends. I'd surrender my, I'd surrender my career before I surrendered my children to this world. Don't let the devil talk to talk you into staying in the land because you'll die and go to hell in the land. And don't let the devil talk you into, if he can't keep, couldn't keep you from getting saved, he's going to try to keep you from going far. I'm telling you, there's a danger in making a deal with the devil. Just stay here. Don't go too far. Leave your children. Okay, well then just leave your stuff. I want to get out of the land, go as far as they let me go, take everybody I can with me, and take all my stuff so when I get there I got something to worship him hey. with. We're going to stand. It, it, I know some of you be afraid. Some of you moms and dads ought to get your children. And you ought to say as Joshua did in Joshua 24, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And if you're here tonight and you've never been saved, you better not listen to the lie of the devil that says you can just, you, hey, you get saved, you're okay, you don't have to come out, man, that guy's lost his mind. I tell a young man one time, he said, preacher, what if you're wrong? I said, if I'm wrong, I'm not, I don't lose anything. Right. I said, but if you're wrong, you lose everything. So you better be careful to listen to the devil when he says, hey, you can have the world and have Jesus too. That's a lie out of hell. And some of us ought to just decide we're going to burn the bridges. I'm not going back. You're... Sid, you ever thought about where you would have been had they not have burned the bridges? See here, mom and dad's the dangerous thing about you not burning the bridges. If you don't burn the bridges and you go back, I've seen a lot of moms and dads through the years go back, take their children with them. And I've seen those same mom and dad come back and get right, but they come back without their children. 
And I watched them sit there and about grieve themselves to death. About grieve themselves to death because they knew it was their decision to go back to the world. And when they got ready to come back, the kids weren't coming with them. I wonder where you'd be. I wonder where he'd be. I wonder where your other brother would be. Had they not decided somewhere, we're not going back. We're going all the way with Christ. He's going to play. We're going to stand. You say, preacher, I can't come to the altar tonight. Somebody's going to think I'm backslid. I'd come so I didn't get backslid. I'd come tell the Lord I want to go all the way. Mom and dad, you say, well, it would embarrass my children. It won't hurt them. And you'll be glad you did. You ought to get them babies down and say, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.